Expectations investing has three steps. The first step is to go backwards and say, the only thing we know for sure in this whole equation is the price. So let's go back and reverse engineer using a discounted cash flow model, which is an appropriate way to think about economic, both theoretically and I think practically, think about what has to happen for this current stock price to make sense, right? So and that's gonna be typically articulated in things like drivers of, of value, which would be sales, growth rate, margins, capital intensity, those kinds of things, right? And so the key to step one is to try to be sort of agnostic, right? Like you don't have a view of the world necessarily. You just wanna say what has to happen or what does one need to believe for today's stock price to make sense, right? So if you want a metaphor for that, it would be where's the bar been set for the bar a high jumper? We don't know how high the high jumper could jump yet, but we know the bar is set at two feet, five feet, 10 feet, whatever it is. Step two is then introducing historical analysis, but more importantly, strategic and financial analysis to judge whether that company is gonna meet, exceed, or come short of those expectations, right? So that's really where the rubber meets the road analytically. And again, history can be a really good guide for that, but but it's also, uh, and, and by the way, the other thing that comes out of this is really important is, you know, typically lower multiples are associated with lower expectations, a higher multiple, high expectations. But you might notice that that whole discussion goes out the window, right? It's not really the difference, just low multiples. It's really how will the company perform vis-a-vis -vis what's priced in, right? So that's step two. And of course, the and, and I should say too, that that is a very probabilistic exercise. We argue that coming out of step two, what you should have is a number of scenarios for potential outcomes, and you should attach probabilities to those. So we're really we're gonna think about the world in an expected value terms rather than, you know, here's the answer. And then step three is of course buy, sell, or hold as appropriate based on steps one and two. So that's the that's sort of the and by the way, the book, the chapters five, six, and seven, that's sort of the core of the book. And that's that lays out each of those steps. So now again, you don't have I'm we're obviously doing, you know, we have a whole apparatus around how to think about this, but you know, the key thing is just to go back always and, and whether you're a handicap or any kind of bet that you're making, right? The question is always, what do I have to believe for this thing to make sense? And that's a fundamental question that you should always be posing about anything, any sort of endeavor like this. So that's the core idea, Jack. I was looking at your expectation investing website. You know, one of the things a lot of investors tend to do is they try to shortcut the process and they try to use a simple valuation multiple to, to sort of get an idea of, you know, if a company is cheap or not. And I was reading your 10 rules of expectations investing on your website and you pushed back on that a little bit. And you, the quote was, the price to earnings multiple is not an analytical shortcut. It's an economic cul-de-sac. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and how you think about simple multiples. There's a little dramatic flair in that phrase, but, <laughs> yeah, but no, you're exactly right. I think that, you know, the point, the point I make over and over is that multiples are not valuation. Let me just stop there. Multiples are not valuation. They are a shorthand for the valuation process. And one should never confuse those two things. Right, so the valuation process is the present value of future cash flows. Multiples are a shorthand. Now, what's good about multiples? What's good about shorthands in general? Right, they save you time. Right, and by the way, I should just be clear. I use multiples. If you and I were having a converse, casual conversation, we might, I would maybe drop multiples about a particular business, whatever. That's fine. But the key is that you understand the economic implications of the multiples that you're using. So you're saying, I think this should be a 15 times EBITDA or the 30 times earnings. Uh, so that, what, what is that? What, what do I have to believe for those multiples to make sense? And so, as you know, we spent a lot of time writing about, we wrote a piece called, what does a PE multiple mean? We wrote a piece called, what does an EVD but down multiple mean? Essentially creating a bridge between those multiples as people tend to use them and the, econo the underlying economic assumptions that you need to make in order for those to, to, to justify those multiples. And just to be really explicit about those things. And you know, as Watt the Motor in at New York University, sort of the dean evaluation, he's talked a lot about this. He's surveyed investor reports and he's found, or analyst reports, pardon me, and he's found that, you know, nine out of 10 rely predominantly on multiples. So this is how people tend to talk to one another. So again, as I tell my students at the end of, you know, sort of the end of our valuation module, you have to sort of earn the rights to even multiples. You, you can use them, but earn the right. And, and the way you earn the right is to demonstrate that you understand the underlying economic assumptions that are embedded, right? So the last thing I'll say, and this goes back to expectations investing, broadly speaking, which is the assumptions about future value creation, investment needs, all that, that's implicit in a multiple. It's implicit. It's not that it's not there. It's implicit. In a DCF model, it is explicit, right? So people go, oh, well, you just changed the assumption a little bit, the value. Absolutely. But that's explicit. So the question is, would you rather have something implicit and buried, and then we don't really know exactly what we're doing? or explicit and overt, and then we could debate, right? And then that, that to me, of course, the latter is a vastly, vastly more attractive proposition than the former. So, 
So economic cul-de-sac might be a little bit strong, but but that's that's the basic idea. And then a related idea I'll just mention quickly is there's a presumption often that growth in and of itself is a good thing. And what we and we demonstrate this in a simple appendix in chapter one, I think it is actually that growth in and of itself is not value. It needn't be value creating. So the, the key concept is growth adds value when a company's earning above the cost of capital, right? So qualifying growth, in fact, the way you should think about it is return on capital, cost of capital spread is first and foremost, and then growth amplifies, right? It makes a good thing better. And if your spread is negative, it makes a bad thing even worse.